sin is acceptable. And we're not going to stand and say that you're safe living for the world and then pretending to be of God. We're not going to do it. And by doing that, we're going to anger the enemy. It is going to happen. And so if you're looking for the safe church, this is not it. This is not that church. And I know that that may cost us most, if not all, of, of our people. And, and I'm just going to be honest with you. Everybody says, don't say these kind of things. Keep it off the stage. But I'm saying to you now, if you signed up for the Lord, you signed up for conflict. And if you're okay with it, then you need to know and I need to know that right now we've got to have something we're standing on that's going to make it, that's going to last, that's going to sustain us. Because the wars we are fighting and the battles of which we've engaged are not to be taken lightly, but they are to be taken to the cross and through the empty grave and laid down defeated at the feet of Jesus. And therefore, today, I can't promise your safety while you're on our campus. I can't. I can say that our security team is doing its best and has been exceptional. Um, I can say that, that your kids are in lockdown in that building and, and we're we're doing everything that man can do, but I'm going to say this. I love the fact that where men come short, God picks up. Yeah. And, and where we cannot, God can. And so I, I this morning, woke up at 2.30. Um, there's been this occurrence happening at our church every single day for a while now. And, and there's birds that are literally almost beating themselves to death on the windows, leaving blood marks all over these side doors trying to get in. And through the week, it's a bluebird, and on Sundays, it's turned into a raven. And, and, and we sit and we look, and, and I was talking to DJ this morning about the symbolisms of bluebird is the symbol of joy and happiness. And they say, if you see bluebirds in your life, it, it, it's a season of happiness, and a raven is a season of death and, and, and a signal of darkness. And they say, if you see ravens in your life, then, then, then there's a chance that, that, that there's some kind of evil at work around you. And I, I want to say this. Every week, we wipe blood off that door. And every week, we wipe it off the handles. And every Sunday morning, around 6 o'clock in the morning, there's a raven that shows up and beats its head against the window. And when we walk around the corner, it flies off and doesn't return. And I, I look at that, and I'm not into mythology I'm into Jesus. And I know that in mythology, you're, you're supposed to be scared of that. But I, I look at it and I'm like, man, you know, we got joy at the door. We got the enemy at the door. If there's any kind of symbolism there, we got to decide which one we're going to let in. And we got to decide which one we're going to stand for. And I know that every one of the advisors and every one of the people that, that would tell me what to say and not to say would advise against what I'm telling you right now. But it is so burning in my soul. I woke up at 2.30 this morning and God just kept me in Numbers and Deuteronomy and I wound up in Joshua. It was like this trip through the life of Moses and in Moses' last speech, what he gave to them, by the way, was chapters and books long. And he's sitting there and he's reminding them of where God has brought them and reminding them of what is ahead of them. And he's telling them, I need you to do one thing. And he pleads with them for six or seven chapters to be obedient to the commands of God. And he says, hey, you're going to conquer this land. You're going to take it. I don't get to go because I wasn't obedient. But you do get to go. Your fathers didn't get to go. Your mothers didn't get to go. But you're going to get to go. Just be obedient while you're there. And God will. Not maybe, not might. God will deliver the enemy to you. God will give you power. God will. He will give you the land that he has promised to you. And I, I know we can come in here today and I can tell you things that would make you feel better about yourself. But let's just say this. There is no power within you or within my words to make you feel good or to make you actually good. But there is power in the name of Jesus Christ to raise you up and establish you in territories of life that you have never earned, that you have never, never once planted in. He told the Israelites, you're going to eat of crops you didn't plant. You're going to have harvest that you didn't sow. You're going to do things and acquire things that you had nothing to do with. And I'm going to tell you, it's not by your works you are saved today. It's by the grace of God. You got a harvest that you did nothing to earn. Jesus did it all. And today, in Jesus' name, he wants to give us the inheritance of God. Freedom. You say, what is 
the truth of that inheritance. Freedom. To not live bound by your guilt or your shame or the stains that sin has created. To not live by the labels placed on you by yourself or by others around you based on actions that you have done or things that you haven't done or things that have been done to you. To not stand in brokenness but to live in this world as if you are free and living in the world that is to come when God creates a new heaven and a new earth. God did not hold back heaven for you. God sent heaven for you so that you would know the way to get there and Jesus declared, I am what? The way, the what, the truth, and what? And no one's going to have those things unless they come through me. Can, can we just put this? Some of you are saying, well, I want to feel alive. Be, be obedient. Well, I, I, want, I, want to, I want the power of God in my life. Be obedient. Go through Jesus. And realize that we cannot do it on our own. And so I found myself drawn to chapter 6 of Joshua. The story of Jericho. And in this story, it starts with this unique statement. Matter of fact, I even, after reading chapter 6, tried to go back to sleep, and the very first sentence kept playing on repeat in my mind. It says, now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go in or to come out. Now, I, I read that, and I looked at our, 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 our world around us. Last year, at the end of the year, if you've been with us that long, I felt this overwhelming need that in 2019, God was going to call us to raise warriors. How many of you remember that declaration being made that 2019, we're going to raise warriors at Grace Community? Will you slip your hand up? All right, and, and, and you know, it, it sounded so exciting it sounded so riveting and, and adventure-filled. I mean, you, you hear the word warrior, and you read in Exodus where God is a warrior, and Yahweh is his name, and you immediately are drawn to medieval scenes that are fighting out and battles of the crusaders and, and all these things that are hand-to-hand -hand combat, and you see these images of, of what a warrior was in the day and time of which the Bible was written, and it seems exciting to raise warriors, but I have realized that in order to raise warriors, there's got to be war, and matter of fact, you can't even say the word warriors absent of war. And I realized that by doing that, that we've invited attack. We have stood on a battlefield and said, we will fight. We will do this. Some of you have fought for your marriages this year, and you've seen God do wonderful things. Some of you are fighting for your finances and you see God doing wonderful things. Some of you are fighting against what God wants to do in your life and you're seeing God still do wonderful things. He's still protecting and still providing, but he's not giving you what you desire because you haven't given him what he requires. And in our lives, we got to understand, you are not called to be the church so that we could come in and play. So that we could come in and go through the motions. We're called to be the church so that we could anger the enemy. So that we could go into the land of promise that's full of corruption and drive the enemy out. And is that not exactly what God told the Israelites to do? He says, you're going to cross that Jordan and you're going to drive every one of the inhabitants of that land out. And I believe in Jefferson County, in our homes, in Sevier County and surrounding Hamblin and Knox, the places of which we reside, the places where we send our kids to school, the places we call home, we need some warriors that are going to go across the Jordan, go through God's provision and walk onto the other side and say, we are taking back the promise that God has given us over our homes and our communities and our society, and we are going to fight what the enemy is trying to do. But you know what I hear in the church a lot? The 10 spies. We'll never make a difference. We, the problems are too big. We start bringing up drugs and immediately we think, there's no way we can rid our county of this plague. We start bringing up adultery and we think there's no way that that's ever going to stop. 
We, we, we stand and we start saying how big the cities are and how big everything else is around us. Matter of fact, if you look at it, did not the Israelites in the book of Numbers say that the task was too great? I mean, these spies come back in, in verse number 28 of this chapter of Numbers, and they, they start saying different things, and they're like, hey, look, the people are powerful, the towns are large and fortified, and they are what? Giants. And in verse 31, they declare their defeat. Two spies say, let's go at once and take them out. Let's go slay the giants. But then in verse number 31, they're like, uh, no, they're too powerful. There's no way. We'll never overcome them. We'll never overtake them. In other words, we have lost before we ever even got started. And I am learning this in, in, in my life. Sometimes I'm defeated before I ever step on the battlefield because in my mind, I've already determined the outcome. In my mind, I've already given in as if fear is the victor and Jesus is the defeated. Anybody else have that happen in their lives too? Yeah. You know, you wake up and you think, I'll never be or my kid will never get right with God, or they'll never come home, or we'll never see revival in America, we'll never see these things happen, and when somebody stands in front of us and says, let's take it back, we immediately tune it out, because we've already believed that it can't be done. Some of us are broken by decisions that we've made, and when someone says you can be made new, we automatically believe that that could apply to everybody else but us, because of all the things and all the places and all the decisions that we've made that have corrupted our lives, but you are one good decision away from a thousand bad ones being defeated in the victory that's found in the cleansing, healing, restoration power of Jesus Christ. And in this moment, the walls of Jericho are, are sealed. The task ahead of them is incredible. And church, we have called you to some incredible tasks. We've called you to stand in front of lions, to stand in front of giants, to stand in front of these things and say, I will not surrender my home. I will not surrender Jefferson County, Tennessee to the hands of the enemy. I will not. Amen. But then we look, pull out my mobile app, and I start going through the inmates, and I realize that guys that we have ministered to that have been set free are now returning. People that we've poured hours into are now back in. And in that moment, there's this, well, you're not doing anything. You're not making a difference. And, and then the very next moment, it says, go back in and let's work again. Amen. Go back in and let's try again. Many of you, we have preached on the sins that you have battled. I've preached on my own, only to find that you pick them back up again and again and again to hear the enemy say that you'll never liberate the church. And I found this to be true. If Jesus isn't good enough to liberate the church, then I cannot be a liberator today. Until the church decides that Jesus is enough, the church cannot be free. And when the church decides that he is worthy, that he is holy, then the church will come alive in Jesus' name and do something in Jesus' name. But we're, we're okay with playing church, are we not? We're okay with pretending, are we not? I mean, I've, I've gone through the motions. Anybody else in here gone through the motions before? I've known what to do. Anybody else known what to do before to make it look as if you're all right, but on the inside, you're unsettled. On the inside, you're plagued by fear. On the inside, your heart is aching and breaking. And on the inside, you don't know what to do, yet you come in and we can act religious and we can act like we got it all together, only to leave the same way we came and then wonder why we don't see God moving in a mighty way. And when someone preaches like this, we give them the phone call of, I'm, I'm scared you're burning out. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm scared that you're getting tired. Why is it that when somebody decides to stand, we try to wear them out? Yeah. When someone decides to be different, we try to shut them down. Oh, yeah. when, when, when somebody stands and says, this is truth, we try to pollute. Right. You know, I'm going to tell you this now. I'm not burning out, man, but my heart is burning up. I'm sick of it. Anybody else sick of it? Anybody else tired of losing our teenagers to suicide? Tired of seeing all these plagues of sin 
breaking through the church and people acting as if they're godly while living for the world on the outside. And we need to come in and say, hey, let's clean up the house of God. Let's get it ready. You're saying, are you trying to get people to leave? No, I'm trying to get them to leave behind the things that are keeping them behind and to step out into the truth that will set them free. But the walls are tight. The grip is strong. Yeah. The task is big. So we need some warriors. Amen. Some people that will say, in the face of danger, I'm still in. Amen. You know, if it's not popular, I'm still in. Yeah. If, if the devil shows up on my doorstep for what I'm about to do, I'm still in. Because I know the doorstep is as far as he can go. Because once he steps in the door, we're going to start hearing some praise of Jesus. We're going to start seeing some worship of God. And he ain't going to stick around for that. And so let him get to the doorstep. But he ain't going to be able to come against what God is doing if God's people would simply do what the Israelites were called to do. And as I examined this story repetitively last night, it took on a whole new meaning. The walls are tightly. The task is big. The gates are sealed, nobody in, nobody out. But I'm here today to declare to you that have been bound for so long, you can be and will be if you'll allow him to set free by Jesus Christ this morning if you'll give in to the truth that he's gonna pour out. I'm here to tell you that are discouraged and worried about the outcomes of your future, whether it be in your resource, whether it be in your relationships, whether it be in your career, whether it be in your brokenness. I'm here to tell you that Jesus brings dead things back to life and at any moment he can breathe into your life, the energy needed that will give you the air capacity to stand up and function off of his realities instead of your own. I'm here to say that today there is hope in Jesus. Amen. But hope is something that we've made a deference. Hope is something that we believe in that hasn't happened in our society. That's not what hope is intended to be. Hope is intended to say, okay, I don't know why you're asking me to grab my trumpet and to grab the Ark of the Covenant and just walk around this wall, but I'm going to do it. Hope says, okay, I, I, I just believe that you've got a reason in it, and I, I don't know why you're, you're going to put me in areas where sometimes there's praise that's billowing, and sometimes nobody's saying a word, but I, I'm going to do it. God, I'm, I'm just going to step in because my hope is in you. It's not in the outcome of the circumstance. It's in the fact that you control the outcome of the circumstance. It's the fact that we can step outside on a mobile life house day and rebuke a storm and then them get on a PA system and say, it looks like the rain is here to stay, only to see it stop so that people can leave and realize that it's because our hope is in God, not in a weatherman. And we say, okay, God, you can do this. And if you can do this, I'm just going to keep working. Right now, our Romania team is in church. Um, they're about to meet the kids that they're going to minister to for the next two weeks. In moments, they're seven hours ahead of us. They will be coming eye to eye, face to face, soul to soul, heart to heart, spirit to spirit with the people that God's going to have them pouring into. And in there, I don't have a hope as if I really hope God does something. I have a hope as in I know God is going to do something and I can't wait to hear about what he's going to do. I can't wait to see. So Casey's FaceTiming her mom, and, 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 and I get a little shot, and, and I just said, Casey, make sure you're armored up. Make sure before you go downstairs for, for, for the, the cabbage that you're eating, make sure you're armored up. Make sure you're ready for the battle that you're about to take on. Hey, hey look, we've, we've got to stop thinking that the battle's not raging just because we don't have a problem. And we need to realize that the people sitting right beside you are in that war and they need a warrior to rise. And so here's what we see. Let's look at this story. And I'm going to give it to you as fast as God allows. But write it down, number one. You see the city gates. You see that the task is, is, is very big. Number two, you see these mighty men, and, 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 and I like verse number two. Let's not skip over verse number two. But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho. I, I wish you would take that verse of your Bible and you would plug in the thing that you're thinking God can't do. I, 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 in my Bible, wrote some things on the side, and I'll just show it to you. I wrote some things on the side that I've been doubting God is able. And when the Lord spoke to Joshua, he says, I'm going to give you Jericho. You know, I, I, what is it that you need today? 
What is it that the enemy has tried to rob from you? What is it that he's attacking constantly in your life? Will you hear the words of God to speak over your life today as God pronounces that the walls of that city are not too high and the gates are not too strong, that in the name of Jesus Christ, he will bring it to pass if you just stay committed and faithful to what he's called you to do. And in there, I, I, I realize so many things can be plugged in. I will give you safety. I will give you words. Now, I, 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 I'm falling in love with words in my life. I love that God has called me to speak his word. I'm craving the words of my son. I, I, I love every time he says a word, and they're becoming more and more frequent the more we go on. And I, I'm, I'm loving at what I hear when someone's ready to stand and praise and worship our God. I love words that are used to glorify God. But let's be real. How many of you can't stand the words that are used out of context and the words that shouldn't be said and the words that are spoken of damnation and condemnation in your life? Anybody else in here kind of sick? of those words I mean uh, 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 the pity party I mean how many of you want to go to a party you know is going to be boring or do you get excited about a party you're guilted into no but how many of you like going to the parties where there's excitement I'm not talking about worldly parties I'm talking about it could be dinner with your friends or a mobile life house on a Saturday <laughs> to where you know Jesus is going to be cranked up to a new level, to where you know there's going to be joy, there's going to be happiness, there's going to be people laughing and having a good time, maybe busting out some rook cards or playing some Monopoly or, or, or going old school with the saris and all those other things, and you're going to sit there, and it doesn't matter if you're good or not, you're still going to enjoy losing. <laughs> you know, I, I mean... You're going to get a good piece of cake, or you're going to get a salad if that's your thing, and, and, and you're going you're gonna to get to look at somebody that you love. I mean, it's like God is saying, hey, guys, we're going to have a party. I've given it to you. But here's what you got to do. And so he tells them in verse number three, let's outline the things that you need. We need some fighting men. Now, and now listen to me. Father's Day was last week. Guys, can I just hit you? We, we don't need cowards. We don't need passive men. Hey, we don't need people that are just taking a back seat and leaving it up to the ladies to get it done. We don't need people that are scared to stand in love and in emotions. We need people, men, that are willing to do whatever it takes so that our homes can be secure. He said, get you some fighting, man that can march around this wall six times. The next verse he says, hey, let, 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 let's get the priest and, 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 and let's get some horns and let's get the ark of God. Can I break down what's symbolizing here? The gates representing a big task. The mighty man representing some people willing to go that God has equipped to do what needs to be done to take down this city of terror, to take down this city that's standing in the way of the promise of God. Hey, let's grab the ark, the presence of God, and let's make sure that it's in the place. And let's get some trumpets, some horns, some praise of God, and let's put it before the ark, and let's walk around these walls. You know what I love about Joshua? Joshua comes in and says, and nobody's going to speak. I mean, it, it would do us some good to realize what praise does to the enemy. I mean, it would do us some good to know what joy of the Lord does to the enemy. To realize that as they walked and marched around a wall that was fortified, that had very strong fighters inside says it. As they would march around this wall, the only call was to blow the trumpet. No one speak. I mean, they could have just started pinging arrows off the top of a wall. I mean, they, they could have just dropped boulders and used catapults like in the old time to just wipe them out because here these guys are going around and the entire nation is just walking around and nobody's got a poor pitiful me story and nobody's got a, well, let me tell you what I saw God do. Nobody's doing any of that. All they're doing is sounding a horn that God's presence is in this place. 
And yet when we come to praise and worship, it's like pulling teeth to get somebody to shout Jesus or to, or to get excited about who God is. When it comes time to sing and to dance and to do the things that bring to the Lord, when it's time to give a testimony of worth, we, 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 we back out and we say, well, I'm too scared to praise the Lord. But I see the videos of you at concerts and I see the videos of you at games and I see the videos of me out in the world celebrating things of the world and we're not scared to praise the world, but something happens when we praise God why do you think there's an attack against praise because the enemy cannot stand to hear the praise of God echoing from his people Amen. matter of fact in chapter number five when they're crossing the Jordan River the Bible says the word of what they did went out through the land and a terror settled in when Rahab is talking to the two spies she says to the spies in Jericho that we are terrified and everybody's terrified of you and when the spies went back to Joshua they said the town is already ours why Jesus got in their heads now, you know what would happen can I tell you this? maybe we would see more of Jesus getting into people's hearts if the people that had him in their heart would get him into people's heads Maybe we would see more battles won if the people that had the joy of the Lord in their heart would put that joy in the minds of others. Maybe we would see the addicts free and the crazy go sane and the demonic come free in Jesus' name if instead of keeping him in our heads, we put him in their hearts, we put him in their minds, we put him out in front of them. And he says, all I want you to do is just blow the horn. I mean, just lift it up and say, he's worthy today. He's good today. He's faithful today. He's a champion today. And so here they go. We got the presence of God. We got the praise of God. And here's, here's how the Bible says it lines up. The warriors go in front. The seven priests with horns. The ark and warriors behind. In other words, ready to fight in a minute, praise in a minute, and just drop a bomb of God in a minute if that's what needs to be done. I mean, in all honesty, it's just like this. Nobody in that day could touch the Ark of the Covenant and live. They could just walk through the streets trying to touch people with God and know that they would not survive. Are you with me? And here they are, and God's saying, keep your mouth shut and just be obedient. Just praise. And yet in our lives, in my life, it's my panic that's heard most. It's my fears spoken most. Anybody guilty as I am, guilty as charged? It's the things I don't like that my family hears the most. It's the things that I'm against that people hear the most. It's the things that could happen that I'm acting as if did happen and I'm living crippled by fear because I, I don't have God's praise going before us saying, hey, we're the same people that just walked through the Jordan River and, and listen, two chapters earlier when the priests carrying the ark, their ankles hit the water, the water Water passed, and the Bible said dried up, and everything else flowed downstream, and they went and they just stood in the middle with God. Amen. And as they stood there, an entire nation crossed on dry ground. You're saying, we need Democrats, we need Republicans, we need the House, we need the Senate, we need the White House. No, we need some people of God to just take God into the middle of the raging river and know that God will dry it up so people can get to safety. But when the people of God are living as if God is not living, <laughs> then, then why do we expect to see people come alive? And so here they are. Day one, let's do a lap. Day two, let's do a lap. Day three, let's do a lap. They had the task. They had the equipped men, uh, warriors. They had the praise. They had the presence of God. And, and you see, they also had a promise. And God says this. Look at it, if you would, in the very last part of verse number five. He says, when, when you hear the priests give one long blast on the ram horns, have all the people shout as loud as they can, then the walls of the town will collapse and the people will charge straight into the town. They had the promise that this is what's going to happen. So just in case you forgot. This is what's going to happen. One day Jesus is going to come back and everything you thought would destroy you is going to be destroyed 
that quick. And one day he's going to set up a kingdom. He's already started it. He's invited you to it if you're a child of God. You're actually living in that kingdom. You may not feel like it because maybe you've kind of drifted outside the walls. Time to get back in the walls and realize that the power of God is real and evident in your life. And one day everything we thought would destroy us will be destroyed. And everything we thought that couldn't be done will be fulfilled. Jesus is coming back. He does win in the end. We are going to heaven one day. We are going to be living in, in, in bodies that cannot be corrupted in a land that cannot be invaded. We will be people of God forever. And today we have a promise that the walls that are so big in our lives will fall and you will overcome it. You will. You're more than a conqueror. We have that promise. So let's march. Let's go. So day seven. Round one. Round two. Seven times. On the seventh the praise came out. You know what quickly followed the praise? The shout. Can I tell you what the shout represents? A testimony. Hey, I got the promise of God, the presence of God. I've been equipped by God. So let me give you a just testimony. God has sent us. We're coming. I don't need to fill it with a lot of words. All I need to say is God is in this, what we're about to do. So you better get out of the way because here we come. And they shout. You know what I found? I was sitting there listening yesterday. My testimony you might want to write this down. My testimony is not about where sin has taken me. My testimony is about where grace has brought me and where God's grace is taking me. Yeah. And, and it's not about all the things that have happened. It's about what God did. And I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be defined by the mistakes of my marriage in the first couple of years. I don't want to be defined by the mistakes of my life in the first 25 years. I don't want to be defined by all the things that have made me messed up. I want to be defined by that moment that Jesus invaded my heart, the moment where the walls came crashing down and alcohol died and Jesus came alive in me and as a result I was raised to life too you may have came in here today with walls of corruption surrounding you but in Jesus name let his praise be heard let a testimony ring through this place in this moment you can change in this moment it can fall and some say the task is too big and we've just got to start saying God's bigger some say it can't be done. And we just need to say, let's believe God. I want to close with this. My entire life, entire life until last night, my belief system of Jericho was that it just fell in Rahab's tower. In my mind, I have this mental picture that everything collapsed and all that stood with this tower with the scarlet robe or this cord, whatever you want to call it, hanging out of it meaning Rahab and everybody in her house was to be spared. Can I just tell you this now? You may be living in a, and I may be living in a world of corruption, but we need some people, Rahab, that'll bring people into the house knowing the destruction that is coming and know that when they're in the house, they'll be safe from the destruction to come. And, and so Rahab goes out and she starts inviting people and she starts saying, you better be in my house when the walls go down. When all this gets thrown down, you better be here because this is where God said that we would be spared. You know what we need to do? You better be in Jesus. You better be right there in Christ when all of this goes down because, hey, the world is going to be destroyed, but those that do the will of God will abide forever. It's time to get in God's house and get God's house in you and then realize that you become God's house and there's a scarlet thread hanging out the window, bled blood of Jesus Christ, covering and signifying that this tower, this home will not be destroyed. Why? Because Jesus Jesus has sanctified it. And I love it. She's a prostitute. Yeah, I, I like that God likes to throw that in there. All you religious people. Just rock your world. He didn't use a governor. He didn't use a priest. He didn't use, and they had a belief system. He did not use one person of faith in Jericho. He used a whore. You say, I don't like that word. Yeah. That's just, it's the truth of what it was. I mean, she was low. I mean, this is somebody that should be drugged outside and stoned according to their laws of the time. I mean, killed on the spot and known to be a prostitute. You know what I found? I, 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 I sat there and I thought and I pondered, I wonder how many doors the spies went to before somebody actually let them in. 
I mean, how many people did they say, hey, hide us? And nobody was willing. And I love this. Church, listen to me. If he can't raise a First Baptist or a First United Methodist or a First anything to do it, he'll go after the prostitute. He'll go after me. He'll knock on that door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock it. If anybody hears my voice and opens the door, what's the next phrase? I will come in and sup, fellowship, spend time with with them and them with me. And hey, it's gonna be an eternal bond here. And I'm gonna tell you this now. I might not have the prim and proper wear the clothes you want me to wear. I might not have all the proper English and, and be as sophisticated as you would like a pastor to be. We may have gravel parking lots with ruts deeper than the Grand Canyon. And we may have all kinds of weeds growing everywhere. We may have paint that is on the building and walls that have been jaded by children throwing balls in this place. We may not look like what you think it should look like, but I am thankful today that God does not look for the ones with the looks. He looks for the ones with availability. And then here we stand in that moment. The prostitute becomes a deliverer, a rescuer. Matter of fact, back up and read that story when you get a chance. And know that when they're going in later in this, they say, don't touch anybody in the house of Rahab. Don't do it. We're going to keep the promise. Hey, I'm going to tell you this. You may feel like you've so messed up that God can't use you, but God's promise is God's promise, and he ain't going to change it based on what you did. And today, if you are living in the defeat that sin has created in your life, know that the promise of God says he'll rescue and deliver you right where you are. And in the moment of your biggest defeat, it can turn to the moment of your biggest victory. And today, nobody else may understand it, and nobody else may want to hear it, but God's going to rescue people through you and what you can do when you just become willing to be obedient to him and so as I looked at that I was like man that's cool but that's not the part that bothered me the part that bothered me is I was under this impression that Rahab's house was the only one left standing when everything else crumbled when the walls fell but that's not what took place God brought down the walls but there was still work to do something had to be done Matter of fact, his command was when the walls fall, you can go straight in. Oh, that hurts. That means, hey, show up on their worst day. Invade. Go rescue, go deliver, go do what you've been called to do. And yes, these men were equipped with swords and they went in and the Bible says, you can look at it in verse number 20 and verse number 21. Matter of fact, back up first to verse 16. The seventh time around, the priest sounded the long blast on the horns. Joshua commanded the people, shout, for the Lord has given you this town, Jericho, and everything in it must be what? Completely destroyed. Uh Uh-oh. I thought God destroyed Jericho. Didn't you? I mean, how many of you have sang that song, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. I mean, has anybody else lived under that illusion that God was the one that wiped Jericho out? He wasn't. God was the one that made it possible for Jericho to be destroyed. But he equipped the people to do it. Are you with me? If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, right? And what, what's he going to do? Heal the land. See, God is a God of empowerment. He can. But if God were to enact what God needs to do to wipe out evil, matter of fact, I've shared this so many times, I'm going to share it again. People beg me all the time for the explanation of why there's still evil in the world, and we've told them again and again and again that if God were to remove evil, well, why would God, isn't it amazing they'll believe in God when they need somebody to blame? Why would God allow somebody to walk into there and do that? Hey, listen, if God were to remove evil, he has to remove everything capable of evil, meaning all mankind would be wiped out. He could, but God's method of making it right would mean for everything that's not right to be taken out. So he sent Jesus to give us a new method so that we can come to Christ and that we could be made new in Christ and then sends us back out as ambassadors so that not to destroy the world, but that through Jesus Christ, the world could be saved. 
How many of you are following this logic? And today, God will bring down the walls of somebody's heart, but he will call us to step in and to destroy the evil that's consumed it. Today, God will bring down the walls that have been holding you back, but he will call you to be equipped and to go and to do what's necessary. But yet we're asking God to bring it all down. And God's saying, no, if I got to bring it all down, that means I got to take you down in the process. But I'm not here to take you out. I'm here to raise you up. So I have defeated the enemy and I have given you the power and the authority to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to raise the dead. Jesus said, you'll do greater things than I have done. He's torn down the veil. He tore down the barrier. And then he gave us this call, go straight in. Go get it done. And yet we stand there, walls crumbled, wondering why the enemy is still at large. And I don't know about you, but I've been given a sword that when it stabs people, it brings them to life. Amen. The word of God that, that builds them up. And at some point, we've got to understand that God has called us, church, to invade. It's almost as if Joshua said, okay, wait for God to do his part. You know what that part was for you and me? Jesus Christ. Amen. The rocks were rent and the graves were open. And on that third day, he walked out alive, risen, conquered Savior. And then he said, go. Get it done. Do it. And they said, drive out and destroy everything. And look at this, if you would. In verse 20, and I'll close with just a couple more verses. When the people heard the sound of the ram's horn, they shouted as loud as they could. God, I, I can't wait to go to a church service like that. Amen. I mean, anybody else want to go to a service where the, the jail starts shaking because somebody's praising in the dungeon? Where all of a sudden at midnight they're singing their amazing grace or whatever the song of the day that praised God and all of a sudden every jail cell came flying open and the prisoners were set free in a moment and a prison guard almost kills himself because he's going to have to stand in the punishment for every one of those, those people that have just escaped and yet those prisoners, oh I love this, those prisoners are the ones that call out and say do yourself no harm. The ones that you're scared are running and about to destroy your life are the ones that God used to rescue their life and last week as we were ushered out by security, thrown into our car. We're driving home. I called my wife on the phone and I said to her, isn't it amazing that the person that's leading us home and the person that's following us home used to be an inmate addict and a, a person of brokenness and the person behind us was an inmate an addict who, who was filled with brokenness and now they're our protection. They're the ones leading. They're the ones following. And in that moment, I told her, we got to find the beauty in this. And the beauty is, it's the ones that God sent us to rescue that in our time of need, rescue us. Yeah. And I'm telling you now, I'm sick of the church looking down on people saying, you can't lead. No, 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 pull somebody out. And I'll guarantee you, the person that God uses you to pull out will be the person God uses to pull you out when you get stuck. And I, 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 I said this. Now, now I'm going to get a little human here. I said, that person is dumb to think that this is the church that they can walk on campus. We got a bunch of thugs. I mean, we got... We got people that'll throw down. I mean, when they pulled on the parking lot, all of a sudden... I saw one addict, two addict, three addict, four addict, five, six addicts go running by the door. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, man, I know that instincts are fight or flight, but we've got some fighters. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm thankful that we got some fighters, but they're not waging war like humans do. No, they're not going after hoping to take someone down. They're going after hoping someone gets raised up. They're standing and saying, hey, if he did it for me, he can do it for you. Hey, when my phone is blowing up with text messages last Sunday, it's an inmate that's visiting saying, hey, I was at church today. God hit me hard. What do I need to do for you? And I'm like, man, at any time I can just be like, you know.
Sean Clark texted me when all this started in our lives. Here's his text. Brother Josh, I love you and I'm thankful for what you did for me. And I ain't scared to go back to jail. I said, Sean, people have fought hard to keep you out of there. Don't you dare go back. He said, I ain't scared. And you know what I found birthed into that moment? Every warrior that invaded Jericho had witnessed the destruction of the generation ahead of them. They buried somebody every 13 feet or so through the wilderness. Am I right, Brother Dick? They saw the warriors that had left Egypt die without ever conquering the greatest conquest. They came from broken homes. They came from dead religion. They came from dead faith. And here's Joshua. Okay, boys. When those walls fall, it's our turn. And I'm going to tell you this now. God did not tear the walls down for you and for me, for us to stand back and watch the Satan, the enemy, rebuild them for others. Right. You know what this passage teaches us? That God took the walls down, but they had to go in and rescue Rahab. They had to go in and destroy what the enemy was doing. They had to. And church, let's stop praying that our county changes and let's start being the change. Let's stop hoping that they get reached and let's reach them. Amen. Let's stop praying that they get delivered and let's step into Jericho. Let's step into that city and let's say, hey, Rahab, hey, prostitute, hey, drug addict, hey, broken person, we are here in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's get out of this town and let's move into the land of promise that God has for us. Let's step in to what God's wanting to do. And at some point, it is my prayer that the church gets so loud with their praise that it rallies the church to charge the enemy instead of sitting back waiting on the enemy to recoup and reorganize. And so close with this. Verse 21. They completely destroyed everything. Paul wrote it this way. In Corinthians, we have the same charge to grab our sword. And this is what he said. We are human, but we do not wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down. Hey, that's, that's pretty cool. The strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We, we destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ, has anybody else caught on to the fact that this battle is not raging for the safety of people in their physical bodies? It's raging for their mental safety to be able to stand stable in the wars of their mind, knowing that the enemy is a liar and that God is true, that even in the midst of adversity, you can stand strong. Let Hell send its best and know that it will meet God head on and will not prevail. He goes on and he says, and after you have become fully, there it is, obedient, we will punish everyone who remains disobedient. You're saying, so we're, we're, we're going to go out there and give them spankings spiritually and all this? No, no, no. Can I tell you what punishment truly is? to have known the truth and yet never seen the truth come alive in your life. I mean, hell to a believer is gonna be to stand before God and realize what could have been accomplished with your life if you would have just trusted God a little bit more. I say it all the time, I do not want my gravestone one day to represent that somebody has died. I want it to stand in its place as a monument that somebody lived the life that God had called them to live. And that while you put my body in the ground, he put my body up in heaven. He says, look at the obvious facts. 
Those who say they belong to Christ must recognize that we belong to Christ as much as they do. Now, I may seem to be boasting too much about the authority given to us by the Lord, but our authority, I like this, builds you up. It doesn't tear you down. So I will not be ashamed of using my authority. In other words, I will not be ashamed in standing in front of giants and fortified cities of the enemy's strongholds and saying, in the name of Jesus Christ, you're going to fall. And in the name of Jesus Christ, the ones that you've held back and the ones that you've held captive will be delivered and they will be changed. And the ones you used to have will now be the ones that got you. And they're going to come after you. I like how God said it to the serpent. You have just started war between you and her seed and her seed is going to destroy you and they're going to stomp your head you're going to bruise the heel but that's all you're going to get and I, I, I am tired of Christians feeling like our, our life's been stumped out of us. Our joy has been stumped out of us when God gave us the stomping ability so in the words of Kirk Franklin let's stomp I mean, let's just get up and say, I'm done with this, and I'm going on. The walls are falling, and I'm going to victory, and I will drive out the enemy of my life and in everybody else's life too. And so in Jesus' name, be free. In Jesus' name, stand. And if it's the last message God ever lets me preach, may it end with the word that we so often shout but never follow, charge. Let's go. Let's take it on. And so if the enemy pulls into the parking lot, charge. Not at them. But at what God has called you to. I'm not giving up my calling. I'm not giving up my family. I'm not giving up my peace. But I will give up trying to figure out the enemy. And I will give up uh, trying to reason with the enemy and instead I'll stand in confidence saying this I don't have to have the enemy figured out I just need to know that Jesus has already figured it out and so therefore I put all my hope and all my trust in him and so for those of you trapped in Jericho be free and for those of you standing outside it's coming down what are you going to do next what are we going to take on so bow your heads close your eyes and nobody look around I know we got Bible school meeting after, for anybody interested, I got that. But let's take some time to respond to Christ. Where are you at today? I mean, some of you, I, I know God has delivered you. I know it. But are you letting Satan refortify that weakness? Or are you going to drive the enemy out? Some of you have given a second chance, third chance, a hundredth chance, maybe a thousandth chance at this marriage you're in. Are you going to keep building it the same way or are you going to drive the enemy out of it so it can be built the way God intended? Some of you have been set free from an addiction of some shape, form, or another only to find yourself returning. If God sets you free, then you should be free indeed. And the way to stay free is to know that God took the wall down. You've got to drive the enemy out. Some of you have paid off debt only to go back in. Some of you have taken up courage only to retreat when a different giant stands that you weren't ready for. Some of us have, have surrendered our peace and our joy to the lies of the enemy. God gives us confidence, and yet insecurity seems to be the identity we walk in. God gives us promise, and yet fear seems to be the thing of which we use to make our decisions. God will tear down the walls for you. But God is a gentleman. He will not force himself on you. And today, your freedom is found in Christ. Your salvation is found in Christ. But because of Christ, you should be and willing to be able to do all things. Your faith is great, but without works, it's dead. 
The walls may have fallen, but Jericho was still there. And somebody had to go drive it out. We may be preaching truth, but somebody's got to be willing to get face to face with the enemy and say, no, no more. He will not do this anymore to my family, to my home, to my county, to my community. I'm an ambassador of the king, a son, a daughter of God. And therefore, today, as he has torn the veil, I'll step through it and I'll take on any fight. You are not in a safe church today. You're in a church that's trying to equip warriors. So conflict is coming. But be of good cheer. In this world you may have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome. So I'm going to open the altars today without a question, without a draw. I'm just trusting the Holy Spirit speaking to some of you today, and I'm just going to ask you to respond. I'm not going to play on your emotions or any other things. We're just going to go to worship, and if God is speaking to your heart, calling the warrior out, calling you to freedom, you respond. He, I, I don't know where you're at, but I know where God is. He's in this place. The ark is here. The praise has gone out. The sound of a testimony has shouted. The walls have come down. The next step is up to you. What do you want to see here, church? Because I want to see one nation under God be true again. I want to see believers able to stand again. So as we worship, you respond to whatever the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. Yes, Lord.